Crown gall is a disease of many plant species and can be found wherever susceptible crops are grown. In California, it is most commonly found on woody perennials and can cause serious losses to deciduous fruit and nut crops. The most susceptible walnut rootstock is Paradox. Among stone fruits, almond and peach are most susceptible, and prune and plum least. Cherry rootstocks vary, with Colt and Mazard the most susceptible. Tumors, or galls of varying sizes, develop at wounds on the roots and crown at and below the soil line. Occasionally, aerial galls are found on the trunk or branches and at the graft union. Unless galls are visible, the only indication of infection may be lack of vigor in young trees. Mature, established trees appear to tolerate crown gall with little effect. However, old crown galls are entry sites for wood-rotting fungi that decay the wood in the crown and the trunk. Such infected trees are subject to blowover in high winds. In some years, thousands of trees, especially almonds, are lost in this way. This program will show the symptoms indicating the infection of galls discuss the cause of the disease and how it is transmitted, demonstrate prevention techniques that growers can use to minimize infection and spread in their orchards, and offer methods for eradication from infected trees. Galls range in size from microscopic to 10 or more inches in diameter. Small galls require careful diagnosis because they can be confused with excessive wound callus or with galls induced by nematodes or insects. The surface of young galls is smooth, but as the gall ages it becomes rough and cracked. In the older gall, the center decays, leaving a ring of gnarled tissue. A gall is composed of disorganized and undifferentiated plant cells. The texture varies from soft and spongy to hard, depending on the amount of vascular tissues involved. The tree will suffer damage if a gall disrupts a large portion of the vascular tissues, thereby interfering with the movement of water and nutrients through the tree. Trees that are severely infected when young grow poorly and may die. Galls are caused by a soil-borne bacterium. The pathogen, Agrobacterium tumefaciens, is the culprit. The species includes both pathogenic and non-pathogenic strains. Non-pathogenic strains are common members of the soil microflora and may be found in great numbers in soil. It is the pathogenic strains that are more closely associated with plants, either in galls or surviving on the root surfaces of host and non-host species. The bacteria infect either through natural openings or through wounds. Natural openings include sites where lateral roots emerge and growth cracks. Frost injury may also be an infection site. Wounds can result from digging trees in the nursery, pruning, and cultivation. The pathogen survives for long periods in healthy gall tissue and has been reported to persist in fallow soil for one to two years, perhaps in association with organic debris. Circumstantial evidence suggests that the crown gall bacterium can be transmitted on asymptomatic trees from the nursery to the grower's field. Because these trees have no visible galls, they are not culled at the nursery. Infections can occur either in the nursery or the grower's field. If the temperature is between 68 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit, galls will first appear as small outgrowths. This is usually within two to four weeks of infection. Infected sites remain asymptomatic if temperatures are below 59 degrees Fahrenheit at the time of and following infection. These latent infections usually develop into galls the next growing season. Because the gall is made of plant tissue, it grows only when the plant is growing. The pathogen colonizes the wound and infects the plant by transferring part of its genetic makeup into a plant chromosome. The pathogen genes then instruct the plant cell to produce hormones that cause disruption of normal plant cell growth. Because all the information needed for gall formation is then inside the plant cells, galls can continue growing without further presence of the pathogen. An integrated approach to preventing and controlling crown gall is important. First, select a nursery that has a low incidence of crown gall. 
For crown gall prevention, it is important to avoid causing wounds at all stages of handling trees. This includes from nursery to cold storage, from cold storage to grower, while transporting to the field for planting, during planting, and after planting. Preventing infection should be the guiding principle in the management of crown gall, beginning at the nursery. Before ordering trees or seedling rootstocks, choose the nursery carefully. Nurseries are required to cull infected trees. Even so, you should inspect all trees you get from the nursery for any signs of galls. If you have a history of crown gall in your field, you might also consider planting less susceptible rootstocks where possible. When replanting an orchard or an individual tree, you may want to locate the new planting sites away from the old tree sites. And finally, there are two application treatments available to help in crown gall management. The first is a pre-plant treatment you can do when the tree first arrives from the nursery. The second is to treat the gall after it has formed. This can be very difficult and time consuming. As with many problems, prevention is the best policy. And that's why you are urged to avoid all root and crown injuries at all times. Beginning with the rootstock before it is planted, a biological control agent can be used. This involves applying a bacterium to the crown and roots that is similar to the pathogen but instead protects the plant from infection. This biological control agent is known as strain K84 and sold commercially as Galtrol or Norback. When mixed with water, many millions of strain K84 bacteria are suspended in the water. This suspension is applied to the roots and crown by spray or dip and the bacteria colonize the wounds thus protecting them from infection. It should be noted that not all strains of the crown gall pathogen are sensitive to strain K84. In addition, K84 only prevents new infections and will not affect trees that are already colonized by the crown gall bacterium. Unfortunately, there are no good alternatives. Bleach, for instance, is just a quick surface sterilizer and is not an effective treatment agent if there is agrobacterium in your soil. Here are the steps to follow for pre-plant treatment. It is important to remember that the crown gall preventatives, Galtrol or Norback, are made up of living bacteria and must be kept cool, out of direct sunlight, and never mixed with bleach to remain viable. Begin by preparing the spray mixture of the preventative at recommended rates with unchlorinated clean water at a pH of no lower than 6.0. If using Galtrol, first remove the lid from the plate and submerse in water long enough to loosen the bacteria. Then gently remove the bacterial slime without disturbing the auger beneath. The spray mixture has a limited lifespan. Premix only enough spray to handle the trees you will treat in one day. Prepare the trees by flushing the roots with a water hose to remove nursery soil and sawdust from around the root and crown. Inspect each tree for signs of crown galls. Discard any infected trees. After inspection, carefully cut off any damaged or extra long roots and recut the ends of any roots that might have been severed when the tree was dug up. Remember to use disinfected tools. Thoroughly spray the entire crown and roots and especially all cut surface areas. On very susceptible trees like Paradox walnut rootstock, soaking roots and spraying the rootstock may be beneficial. Do not leave the sprayed trees exposed to direct sunlight for long periods. Trees should be planted immediately. As with all other tree handling procedures, tree planting should completely avoid damaging the treated trees. Make sure the trees are not wounded by your use of planting boards, shovels, or stakes. In fact, when installing stakes, it is a good practice to place the stakes in the holes during planting rather than risk creating injuries from stakes driven into the ground after planting. The soil should be firmly placed around the roots, again without creating wounds. It is recommended to plant trees high to eliminate the need to pull trees up to grade after settling, since such repositioning can injure roots. Also avoid irrigating or settling soil with subsoil water probes which may also wound trees. 
After planting, it is still vitally important to avoid all crown and root injuries. Growers often apply sand at the base of young trees to improve tree stability in the wind, to avoid leaning trees, and to prevent water collecting at the base of trees. Unfortunately, this practice may also favor crown gall disease. Movement of the crown and upper roots back and forth in the wind against sharp sand or gravel particles can cut or abrade roots and allow entry of the pathogen. Alternatives to sanding include staking the trees and increasing winter and summer pruning. To avoid wounding trees, weeds should be controlled with sprays or other non-cultivation methods. Planting trees on berms further prevents disking close to the tree. Avoid the use of hoes, discs, and cultivators around tree trunks, especially in paradox-rooted walnut trees. Cultivation next to the trees greatly increases the chance of wounding and subsequent crown gall infection. With walnut in particular, applying urea ammonia nitrate as a fertilizer has the side benefit of controlling young, non-woody suckers. If necessary, on walnut and stone fruit, including almond, Use shears to cut woody suckers, but be sure to disinfect your tools between trees and treat cut surfaces with gall trawl or norback. If those are not at hand, leave a two to three inch stub of the sucker to avoid injuries closer to the crown bark region. Return later to cut close and apply protectants. The shorter the interval between creation of the wound and treatment, the more likely the treatment will be effective. Air temperature also affects outcome. Longer intervals between wounding and treatment are less dangerous at lower temperatures. At moderate temperatures, treatment must occur within a few hours of wounding for the best control. So remember, the warmer it is, the less time you have to respond. Once you have detected the presence of galls, either visibly at or above ground level, or by the telltale ground heave that occurs at the site of some underground galls, you have a few choices to make. You will have to keep in mind that treating galls is a labor-intensive activity using costly treatment materials. Since galls often cause stunted trees, replacing young, vigorous, infected trees may be more economical than treatment depending on how severe the gall is. In most cases, a mid-sized tree would be treated, but if the tree is still vigorous and the gall is too extensive, it could be left alone. Stunted trees should be replaced. Often mature, vigorous growing trees may not benefit from treatment and are usually left alone. Once a gall appears at ground level, there may be extensive galled tissue on lower crown and larger roots. That is why early treatment when galls are smaller is more effective and less costly. The second treatment you can apply is based on the application of Gallex to established galls. Gallex is not a biocontrol agent and is not effective when preventing galls, but when applied carefully can help remove existing galls from trees. Treatment can be done at any time during the year, but doing it when dry is best. Once treatment has been deemed necessary, in the case of this tree with a gall suspected on the crown, the soil will have to be removed, surgery performed, and gall X applied. To begin, it is a good idea to be prepared to deal with whatever you find below the surface. A treatment cart of some kind on hand with all the tools and equipment needed from start to finish is very helpful. First, you will need to expose the crown and upper roots. Soil can be removed using high pressure water, a supersonic air jet, or a shovel. Using water or supersonic air jet is less likely to create new wounds. If a shovel is used, it should be sterilized with diluted bleach before digging. Expose the lower crown and upper roots wherever gall tissue is found. If a shovel is used to remove soil, a sterilized trowel should be used very carefully to expose the gall. If water is used, allow the site to dry one or more days before proceeding. Pneumatic excavation uses a supersonic jet of air traveling at nearly one and a half thousand miles per hour to blow soil from non-porous objects. Roots one millimeter in diameter and larger are left intact. Hydraulic excavation uses a high pressure steam of water to remove the soil. 
The hydraulic equipment is more readily available, but it also makes more of a mess and requires a drying out period. Either method is effective in exposing the galls to be treated. You may discover some galls that are not worth removing. These would include galls on the smaller roots. On stone fruit, like almond on peach rootstock, galls smaller than 3 to 4 inches in diameter do not need to be removed surgically before being treated. On walnut, however, it is recommended to remove all galls before treatment with Gallex. Once the site is dry, it is ready for crown gall removal. Typically, you will use a hatchet or a chisel and hammer. Remember to sterilize your tools with diluted bleach before and after use to prevent spreading the bacteria. Remove all galled tissue all the way down to healthy wood. This may take as long as one and a half to two hours where galls are extensive. Take your time and be careful not to create new wounds in any part of the tree. Once the gall is surgically removed, pick up all galls, gall chips and pieces since they may harbor the bacteria that caused the problem in the first place. Put the discarded material into a container and make sure it is removed from the orchard to prevent recontamination of the soil. Use a dry paintbrush to brush away dirt on the area to be treated. As with any agricultural use product, it is important to read the label on the Gallex container and follow the directions for its use. Gallex is a skin irritant, so you must wear rubber gloves and follow the instructions on the label for proper personal protective equipment and other user safety recommendations. Shake the Gallex container well. Do not dilute the product or mix it with other pesticides. Pour a small amount into a container from which you can use the paintbrush to apply the treatment. Paint the Gallex on the area where gall has been removed plus a half inch of surrounding healthy bark. Once completed, leave the site to dry one or more days. Then replace the soil. Some growers leave the site excavated without harm as long as water does not stand around the crown. Remember to sterilize all equipment again before going to the next tree for treatment. The tree should be marked and rechecked four to six months later. If all has gone well, the gall will be totally eradicated. However, there may be some gall tissue regrowth. Sometimes these regrowths will require treatment. On stone fruit, including peach or almond, when a gall is smaller than a baseball, the gall does not need to be surgically removed. Paint the gall and a half inch of surrounding healthy tissue with gall X. Let dry and recheck the site in four to six months. There is one additional technique that has been used to address gall problems. Where galls are extensive on walnut, some growers will inarch with either Northern California black or Paradox rootstock to overcome the vascular disruption caused by galls. In conclusion, this program has shown the symptoms indicating the infection of galls. It has discussed the cause of the disease and how it is transmitted, and demonstrated prevention techniques. It has also shown methods for eradication from infected trees. Research continues on crown gall, the transmission of the pathogen, and methods that nurseries may eventually be able to use to make certain that the grower is getting clean, agrobacterium-free plants. Other surgical and application treatments to remove galls are also being tested. For more information on the prevention, detection, and eradication of crown gall, contact your local University of California Cooperative Extension Office.